small town but good doctor. I think of, you know, when I think of Dr. Marconi, I think of, of the doctor in Doc Hollywood, not Michael J. Fox, sorry, Doc, but the old guy. You know, Michael J. Fox comes in there, and I, I remember that scene where they're rushing this kid out. They think he's got this heart problem, and the helicopter's landing. And the old town doc, you know, comes driving up and says, no, and he pops open a can of soda and says, give him this. And that, and that you know, he just got into his dad's chewing tobacco and just, just do this instead. And, and he's just the, you know, that epitome of the, the, the small town. You know, I grew up here in Visalia. My pediatrician was Dr. Castiglione, Dr. Cass, as we all knew him. And I just, I see that in Dr. Marconi, just somebody who really cares about his patients. And we well, apply to medical school, we're often asked, why did you go into medicine? And of course the pat answer is, because I like people, because I want to help people. Uh, there is no question Dr. Marconi likes people and wants to help people. I've seen him in so many different capacities that he's just like that you know, country doctor with his bag along the way, finding people as he goes along. From the very beginning, um, I've always had this interest in people and people who underserved. I mean, I grew up in dirt streets of northwestern Pennsylvania. So um, I'm not from a wealthy background. I began to mature a little bit. I was working in a pharmacy and the real turning point was is that I was going to go to pharmacy school and the pharmacist said no. Uh, you really need to go into medicine. You've got the qualities to be a doctor. And nobody had ever said anything like that to me. Um, and so at that point that's where I had a direction, a career change, become more motivated and so, you know, I had had the 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 initial preparation, you know, I had the the the, the biological and chemical prerequisites, but not any type of thought process. So that's that's it. That's the way it uh, it all started. He was fun. We had we had fun. Uh, we went for a walk on campus, and I'm there telling him crazy things now that I think about it. I said, oh, love chemistry. Well, I really did just like the periodic chart, you know, and I knew what gold was. And, and he's really impressed. Wow, you like chemistry? And I didn't even really know what I was talking about. And he was just, we went to a movie, and that was our first date. Actually, after I met him, we just were together for the next four years while I finished school and we got married after I got out of college. So it, it was like, that was it. I knew, he knew. I wasn't able to get accepted into medical school, which is, uh, I went to graduate school, I got you know, straight A's and, you know, that type of stuff. But the, the competition was, was there, and so at the very last minute, that's why I ended up going to Guadalajara for two years. Dad did his first two years at Guadalajara in Mexico and um, of medical school, and my sister Jennifer and I both went to school there. I, I think when you look back and having young children, I can't imagine taking them to a foreign country and living for two years so far away from family and, you know, just I think Dad was at school a lot. Uh, he got this application and, you know, he had, going back and forth, we had three children and, and the youngest was only six months old. And uh, he said, well, we can just go for the interview. And so we left the kids with my mom and my dad said, now whatever you do, don't do anything rash. And so we get there to Guadalajara and never having been out of the country, we have my purse between our hands as we're walking down the street. I mean, the people are so nice there, but we were just not sure what to expect and uh, when we when we got to Mexico it was you know right away they I think it was you're in what you could see when you were there academically we were using the same textbooks they, we were taught in Spanish but the books were exactly the same and so we had the little closets and study groups where we uh, went and hid away but the idea of, the, of this uh, clinical experience was, was lacking. And so uh, the, we actually got an old church 
and had it made into a clinic. And it was an experience like nobody could ever remember. We went there and people would come in lines and sit there all day and we were second year medical students treating things and uh, bringing medicines back from here. The professors that we had at school, they were very helpful. So they became clinical instructors and the clinic, uh, I, I've heard that it's still there, still, still functioning, still in the same area. It serves the poor. You know, on behalf of the city, how fortunate we are to have a doctor who has been here for so long, like Dr. Marconi in our community, again, who, who is, is, you know, obviously has succeeded and done well for himself in the community, but has given that back to the community tenfold. I mean, this is, this is Tulare County, this is the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, we're one of the poorest counties uh, in the state, or poorest areas uh, economically. Uh, and Dr. Marconi uh, willingly serves others. I know that uh, you know, he was involved with uh, uh, the Catholic Church in establishing clinics here. Uh, I mean, it simply said the man has a heart to serve others. Dr. Tiss became ill and uh, I then became the director of the Good News Center. Um, and then this horrible thing occurred uh, where the Good News Center became uh, a conflict for the church. I mean, when you have three nuns that are three nurses that are extremely adept at understanding the needs of the illnesses, they spoke Spanish, they, had, they provided income, uh, all stability, sorts of things, that was gone. And so we then needed a, to, to restructure this and to see what to do. And then we were discussing models, but there was no location. And a realtor, his name's Bill Whitlatch, calls me and he says, hey, can I meet you at one o'clock? I got a potential place. And it was the old juvenile hall. We went into the juvenile hall, opened it, the door literally came off the hinges. I mean, it's like a, a movie. The dust is in there, you can't see. There are books and all this sort of stuff. Black widow spiders. Um, and so they built this clinic and then from there then this became an ecumenical council. I'm the medical director. The clinic currently is, is run under my private license. We take absolutely no grants. We'll take, you know, donations, but there are no grants. Everything so we can tell everybody, if you give us something, you can be guaranteed that it goes to the poor and nobody is, you know, there's no financial uh, involvement. We don't have second rate people reading MRIs of the people that we serve. They're the, they're the top people. And then we have volunteer surgeons so that we have the people that uh, don't participate in the clinic per se, but they will provide uh, surgical services um, and so on. And that's done in the hospital. And that's all done on this, this voucher system, which is very unique. I've made a lot of house calls. I mean, I can, some of them are some of the most strange things uh, that, that you could imagine. I almost got shot the first, very first house call that I did. I was on call the 4th of July. And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, no, there was some, many, uh, just so many uh, house calls, a lot of uh, interesting things. You really get to know people when you go in their house. Up, whether he's intense about what the treatment plan is going to be and the variety of opportunities and directions that we can go, or it's just telling his own wonderful story about his own grandkids. He's definitely someone who can bring a smile to your face. My mom had a stroke and she was in the hospital for about three days and when we talked about transferring over to rehab, you know, my first thought was I, I want Dr. Marconi to be her doctor because I, I just know how he cares about his patients and, and he, again, he looks, he looks beyond, you know, the symptoms of, of what's happening right here and now. Why, why did this happen? What can we do to, to change this for the future? And, I, and he would sit, I remember I'd see him the next day and he, he'd say, you know, I sat and I talked with your mom till 10 o'clock at night and he would just talk about family and things like that with her, which, um, you know, made me feel very good. You know, he provides consultation to our staff and he's a teacher. He teaches our folks about uh, what to look for and he's, since working with us, become an expert in a number of areas uh, related to end-of-life issues uh, 
and also uh, feeding issues in particular. You know, some of our folks would present uh, with a problem in an emergency room and within a couple of days they might have a feeding tube and they've never had one in their lives. And Dr. Marconi has changed up and down the San Joaquin Valley, that practice. I think Dr. Marconi is dedicated to his patients and to the practice of medicine in a way that today you don't see many uh, physicians that have that commitment. There are times in the end of the day when I have to see a patient and he's in there and says, oh, he might be in there a long time. So sometimes I would ask him, hey, Dr. Marconi, can I see this patient before you can? And, and most of the time he would say, yeah, that'd be fine. He's really a wonderful physician and his compassion and understanding of the, the challenges that people with developmental dis disabilities face is beyond compare. Um, I, I really dread the day that he chooses to retire because I, I haven't seen anyone like him out in the field. Um, it's, it's really amazing to devote your life to working with the population that we serve and still do all the other things that he does. Martin Buber, the Jewish theologian, said that God regards us as a thou, that God looks at us as individuals of infinite worth, sacred worth, and that we ought to regard each other in the same way as a thou. Dr. Marconi, he regards all of us as a thou. Um, this is a poor county, Tulare County, has a lot of disadvantaged people, and he has always treated everybody as a person of sacred worth. And that's something that was clear from the first time I met him, and through the years, I've seen that in so many ways. In short, he's the best doctor that I've ever worked with. When you look at medical knowledge, when you look at uh, bedside manner, uh, he really combines it all. I mean, he is the, uh, really the yardstick against I would measure any physician. One of his best qualities is that he maintains a good balance in his life. So he's, he's a very hardworking, he's a very smart person but he's also a really fun person to be around. If you've been around him a lot, you kind of want to sit down and hang out with him. But one of the things he started was um, the spring fling and the fall ball, and he started this party that medical staff. And it's, it's a great way to mingle, to meet people, to have camaraderie between medical staff. He likes to work hard, but he likes to have fun. So, and that's how he kind of raised all of us. We work hard and, you know, we play hard too sometimes. We just, we like to kind of maintain a balance between um, sports, between, you know, having friends and going out and, and working hard and going to school. So. Who inspires me? Yeah. My wife. Okay. My wife has is, is, is been, it's an incredible story because you come home with someone and you say, I want to go to Mexico, I'm learning to be a doctor. And we've got little kids. And she loves her family and you know, that kind of stuff. So the life of a doctor is not what people think. You know, this phone rings all the time. There's people standing. You know, the kids are waiting to go to breakfast in the hospital lounge for an hour. Uh, Judy never complained. And so you can't, to me, I'm so much of a believer in family and you know, what, I, what I think I do, but you can't do that without somebody supporting you. So really, if that's, that's the case. And I mean, there's no doubt that, that I could never have done this without my wife.